Hey, Barbara. Oops, I can't oops, hear oops. you. Oops. Hi, Leslie. Go. No, I was muted. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. We've got lots of people coming in. So, Leslie, I just made you a co host. So, if you'd like to um, keep an eye on the participant box and let people Great. in, I'll do it as well. But once I do my intro, it'd be helpful if you keep an eye on that too. Where do I let folks in, Barbara? Because it's so not. I hit it should be on the participant box. Yeah. If you have your participants, it'll say, it'll start saying admit. And it it has not done that yet. So far, you know, uh, we I let in a few people, and I don't see a um, anybody else uh, hopping on yet. Okay. Okay. So let's give it another minute or two. Oh. And when I see when I see the box pop up, I'll ask you if you get one as well. Sounds good. Oh, I just see one. Do you did you get one in the waiting room? Ah uh, yes. All right. So I'll let I'll I'll just start letting people in. Okay, that sounds great. Thank you, Leslie. Sure. Hi, Sandy. Hi, Barbara. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. Uh, I can't believe we're here at the the first session of our seven session program. Yes. It's very exciting. I'm really quite excited about it. We've got uh, about a hundred people signed up for today. So it's a big, gonna be a big crowd. And we are recording so that um, will make it available to people who weren't able to attend today. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. Hey, Rick. Hey. I just made you a co-host, so. Okay, cool. I feel yeah. special. Hi, Sandy. <laughs> Hi, Rick. How you doing? Good. So uh, is everybody else muted or are we talking live here? Well, right now, uh, I think we've had the participants well-trained because they seem to come in and be muted. So <laughs> hi, everybody out there. Hi, Thank everybody. You. <laughs> but Thanks you for being muted. Recording. Yeah. But if you want to unmute and say hello, that's that's fine too. We have a few minutes before we get started. Sure. But yeah, um, yeah, I'll introduce the program and then I'll remind everybody to mute as well because um, I just said we've got about a hundred people signing on today. So hi everybody. Just wanted to introduce myself, but uh, I'll probably mm -hmm. have the video and speaker off. That Great. makes sense. Great. And Thanks, buddy. sounds great. Thanks. Hi. All right. And Elizabeth, Elizabeth Harper, are you um, joining us with a few other people from Sunapee? I don't know if she's not. Yes. Oh. Sorry, I just had to unmute myself. Yeah, we're getting set up and um, we have a good handful of people who will be joining us here at the Center for Lake Studies. So we should have a, a crowd here as well. Well, that's great. I love that idea. So um, Elizabeth is with. Um, Sunapi, Elizabeth, could you just introduce okay. yourself? Yeah. yeah, I'm Elizabeth Harper. I'm the executive director of the Lake Sunapi Protective Association. Um, so what we've done, we have a great new, newly renovated facility, and we've invited um, some of the folks from our local conservation commissions in our watershed to come and join us here today um, so that we can watch the training and then spend a little bit of time afterwards you know, discussing um, what their experience has been with wetlands issues and, and have a chance to come together as a group. So I think we have about 12 that are signed up and a few more that have called in today. So should be a good group. That's great. That's a great idea. So Elizabeth suggested it, um, doing this kind of as a group, which I think is a wonderful idea. While we'd all love to be in person to do this kind of um, programming, it's it it's a challenge these days and we're all over the state. So if you are interested in kind of hosting an event 
um, and using these training sessions as a reason to get together with conservation commissions in your community. Hey, just reach out and I'd be happy to um, you know, help you through that, but it's pretty simple. Just have one person uh, be the host and sign in and, and everybody else can join and watch together, so. Yeah, so we appreciate you providing the training because it makes that easier on our end too to make sure that good information gets out and um, it helps us with our efficiency, so. Yeah, and if you haven't been to the Lake Sunapee Protective Association headquarters. It's a lovely spot and uh, I definitely recommend checking it out. That would be great. Yeah, we have a bunch of new exhibits and we're, we're open nine to five Monday through Friday and people are welcome to drop in. Wonderful. All right, well, we just have a few more minutes before we officially get started. Rick, are you, you're probably all ready to go, aren't you? Sure. Yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> Rick's always oh, wow. ready to go. Right. I know. I, I know. Can't. Silly, silly question, right? Say the word. <laughs> right. All right. Well, we'll just kind of hang around a few more minutes here. So I imagine there's a few people that are going to join in exactly at 11, at exactly at noon, and then maybe yeah. a few afterwards. So. Yeah, Barbara, you said there was a hundred and how many? We've got like a hundred and forty signed up. Forty. Yeah, but often a lot of people register but don't attend in person. So I think we're going to have a hundred. I bet close to a hundred people. Yeah. At, at and then this. how many groups besides Elizabeth? That's a great idea. Doing that a is group. a great. As far as I know, Elizabeth's our first uh, group that has offered to to host a meeting. So. Um, that's why I'm kind of wanted to point it out because I do think it's a great idea uh, to be able to uh, discuss some of the information that we're presenting here today um, and and doing it as a group or as a region, I think will be helpful. So maybe yeah. maybe we should try to spread that word a little bit more. So Elizabeth, I'm curious, I know you you just talked, but do you have a, a webcam that's uh, zoomed on this on a screen that's projected or are you all crowded around a laptop or how is it <laughs> here I'll, um this is this is our setup in here so <laughs> we have a, a fairly large kind of movie screen at the front of the room and then you know we have flexible seating um in this this is our harbor room so we can have you know, small table set up with chairs and we just um, you know, kind of change our layout depending on the size of our group. But we've been hosting a lot of different, um, you know, people from local lake associations recently and conservation commissions and trying to reach out to all the stakeholders and people who are doing good work out there and giving That's opportunities to, to share. That's great. So, so we have some people that are starting to file in. So all right. um, you'll start to see the seats fill up shortly. Just, I mean, yeah, I was just curious, Barbara, because, you know, last night we did a program at Tin Mountain and uh, we projected it. We did it live for in person and projected it for Zoom participants. And um, we had a little challenge. Uh, we don't have one of those fancy projectors that, you know, so we just tied it into a laptop and use the laptop webcam. So you can't really see anything but the shared screen, which yeah. is, you know, it's a little different than if you're able to see the people as well. So I, you know, the hybrid is a little bit of a challenge. We, we did three yeah. programs at the conference this year and we hired somebody, but they were in the back of the room. So the screen wasn't as visible, the, you know, there's a couple different ways of doing it and it's we're still trying to get a, a good handle on how to how to best do the hybrid thing so we got it we have to get one of those owls that you know yeah. move around yeah yeah my husband you know, has his rotary group you yeah. and used to do that we we i remember teaching wetlands at the old unh campus in manchester and i don't know if you remember that but they were linked to durham and plymouth and they had this you know live screen that was for the presentation and then each a separate screen for each of the classes in the 
offsite locations. And I could actually look to one side and in the screen and see, you know, students raising their hands with yeah. questions. And it was pretty cool. I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. UNH has got some good stuff going. They're definitely yeah. um, way, way beyond what we have. So I should probably check in with them and see what they recommend. <laughs> yeah. Put it in the budget. <laughs> yes, I know. I know. Right. <laughs> So, all right, well, I'm just going to wait one or one minute, one or two more minutes and uh, get going on this yeah. program today. Nice. To, hi, Bart. It's nice to see a few folks I haven't seen for a while. Hi, Irit. Okay. Good to see you, Rick. I was thinking about you the other day. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, we're, we're having problems down here. I'm on the... Uh, uh, planning board and we're having a guy came in and stripped out a bunch of trees on a place that's really questionable and he's already been uh, giving us all kinds of problems on another project in town and we're to the point where we might have to find a soil scientist or a water yeah well sorry to hear that but that's uh that that is not uncommon these days <laughs> No, it's not. And yeah. uh, so maybe maybe this camera will finally work. I've been playing with it for 10 minutes. Here. <laughs> <laughs> so hi, Barbara. I haven't seen you for a while. Hi, Bart. Yes, it has been a while. <laughs> we haven't had our roast meetings in a, in a while, so we'll have to get those up and running again. Yeah, well, I, I went to the last one they had. I don't know. I think it was the last one they had in Milford. Mm -hmm. so, I finally retired from the Conservation Commission. Okay. Uh, too many wow. politics. I, I did it for, I don't know, 15 years or something like that. Yeah. A long time. Uh, finally decided to take a, take a break. Take a break. Yeah. You hear well, that, Barbara? There, there's another potential board member right there. I, I'm there's writing that. it down right now. Okay. He's got all this time now. Yep. <laughs> all right. All right, well, I'm going to just go ahead and introduce myself. For those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Barbara Richter with the New Hampshire Association of Conservation Commissions. And um, NHACC is a nonprofit organization, and we work with our New Hampshire Conservation Commissions. We support the work that they do so that they can be successful in protecting their local natural resources. We provide education and assistance to 217 conservation commissions here in New Hampshire. And, um, and hopefully many of you know that we host a conference every November, the first Saturday in November. Um, and we provide lots of training like this one um, at our conference, as well as our annual meeting and a keynote. But um, today's program, is the introduction to wetland identification with Rick Vanderpoel. And he's with Ecosystems Management Consultants and a certified wet wetland scientist. Our program today is going to cover the identification of wetlands, basic hydrology, soils and plants. We'll have an overview of wetlands functions and values and an over overview of wetlands types, ecology and classification. Then we'll follow up with some resources to help identify those, those types of wetlands. So um, what we're doing too is um, this program is going to be recorded and I will either follow up later today or on Monday with the recording as well as some links and helpful resources and additional information. So this is the first program in our training series um, we created this series to help conservation commissions better evaluate their local water resources and develop a program, a proactive program really for protection. NHACC oh, wow. developed this program with um, New Hampshire DES staff and a couple certified wetland scientists that are on this program today, including Rick. So we're in good hands. Um, as many of you know, wetlands are among the most biologically diverse and unique habitats on earth. And when they're allowed to remain in their natural state, wetlands provide many public benefits. I'm gonna just ask people to mute. We should have, should have brought this reminder at the beginning. Before we get started too far, I uh, just wanna let you know that 
you can use your mute button so that we can ensure good quality for everybody. And I can try to um, remind people as well. And I can mute them from my end. But if you have a chance to do that right now, just hit your mute button. Um, and we're also going to ask that you, um, we invite participants to ask questions, but we're going to ask you to use your chat box at the bottom of your screen. Again, we have a lot of people joining us today, so it's going to be really hard to raise your hand or even use the raise your hand feature because we won't be able to see everybody in one sight line. So go ahead and use that chat box. I'll be monitoring that, and then I'll get back to Rick at the end of the program to answer any of those questions. So. Back to a quick explanation of, of how we came about this training series here today. Um, again, we've been working with New Hampshire DES. We all recognize the need for commissions um, to learn more about the wetland permit process, um, identifying wetlands, and how to best um, respond to those permit applications. So, um, so let's see, we've... Um, We've developed this as a seven part series, and this is the first training in that seven part series. Uh, five of them are going to be online, and then the last two are going to be in person. And in that follow up email, I will send the remaining list of all of the um, sessions so that you can get those on your, on your calendar if you'd like. So, um, and today we thought we'd start the program again with a really basic introduction um, to identifying wetlands. So we've invited Dr. Rick Vanderpoel here today to walk us through wetland identification and the benefits of wetlands and why we need to protect this resource. So Rick is the principal of Ecosystems Management Consultants out of Sandwich, New Hampshire. He's been a certified wetland scientist since 1998 and his company has conducted wetland delineations and wetland assessments in more than 128 New Hampshire towns. He's taught various wetland courses at Antioch New England Graduate School and Plymouth State University. And he's the co-author of Method for Inventorying and Evaluating Freshwater Wetlands in New Hampshire. So obviously we're in very good hands today and I'd like to invite Rick to join us and get us started on the program. Okay, great, Barbara, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, she, she underscored, this is the, the introductory program, the basic one, the beginning one. So I'm gonna start from scratch here and really pretend that nobody knows anything. Although I see a lot of names I recognize, <laughs> people I've worked with who know a lot more than, than many of us. So um, if we kind of spanning the, the range from beginning to somewhat expert, we've got some other wetland scientists uh, not the least of which is one of our co-presenters, Sandy Crystal, who will be uh, presenting with me on the next session, which will talk more about jurisdictional areas and the difference between federal and state jurisdiction, et cetera. So we've got some great programs lined up, and I want to uh, first you know, thank Barbara and the NHACC for sponsoring this program. It's something we've done in the past. It's something that is never too old a, a subject to cover again. Uh, I also want to thank Marianne Tilton from DES who helped uh, in the planning of these seminars and will be our principal presenter on a couple of them. And in advance, a couple of other wetland scientists, Mark Jacobs and Mark West, who will be um, helping us with the functional assessment seminar later on in the spring. But right now, we've got to sort of dive into the, the basics, and I'm going to go ahead and and share my screen here. All right, can everybody see that okay? Got yep. a thumbs up, Barbara? All set. All right, great, terrific, thank you very much. So as, as this is entitled the introduction, that's what, what basically we're, going to talk about what is a wetland. Start at the beginning. Areas that are transitional between uplands and deep water habitats, and we'll talk a little bit more about where those transition points are and how to recognize them, uh, but this is really you know, what we're dealing 
Rick? You're muted. Rick, yep, yeah, we're not able to hear you, Rick. So I think we missed. Somehow you got muted. Yeah, I don't know how that happened, but how's okay. that? That's All right, better. Right. All right, back, you might have to back backtrack a little. <laughs> okay. So uh, wetlands are areas that are transitional between uplands and deep water habitats. Um, generally, that uh, transition zone on the deep water side is two meters or 6.6 .6 feet. Um, and we also have areas on the other end, uh, the edge of wetlands, or excuse me, uplands, that have saturated soils for a certain length of time during the growing season. Commonly, they are dominated by wetland plants, um, or at least plants that prefer to grow in wetlands. And typically, we have places like swamps, bogs, marshes, vernal pools, um, edges of lakes and ponds, that type of area that we're talking about. So sometimes it's um, fairly easy to identify where wetlands are. And if, if you're an excavator and you end up having to crawl out of your cab, that's probably a good indicator that you're in a, in a wet situation. Um, this is a kind of uh, incident that you don't wanna get into. But other times, it's not so easy. This is challenging wetland delineation number 62. Pit and mound on a sloping hard pan dominated by hardwoods, basswood, sugar maple with a few green ash and as well as a few elms, a couple of fact wet species. The understory is largely white ash, saplings with a few sugar maples. And the surface water is right there in the springtime. Yeah, it has mounds with bracken fern and pits with a variety of sedges. as well as lady fern and cinnamon fern. There's quite a bit of sensitive fern here as well. So that covers at least one of several different challenging areas that um, may be tough for even us wetland scientists to identify. Um, but at the very least, we can count on the fact that water is present, at least during a certain portion of the year. And like I said, that the source of that water can come from a variety of places. Um, and sometimes it's not as obvious, particularly in groundwater wetlands that are fed by groundwater, um, when those wetlands are wet, actually a long enough period of time to produce that predominance of, of wetland plants. Soils clearly have to be present and soils that are typically what they call hydric soils. And these are areas that have been subject to enough water where oxygen is not readily present in the soil fraction. Um, those areas are as anaerobic areas as they are, typically have things like sulfides replacing those oxygens at the cation sites that require some type of bonding. And that saturation and the presence of sulfides gets released when exposed to oxygen. And sometimes you can identify those by smelling a hydrogen sulfide odor, the sort of rotten egg odor. That's um, not uncommon in our hydric soils. We also have plants. And wetland plants are um, a requirement they're one of the three technical criteria for identifying wetlands. And those plants can commonly include, um, you know, upland, otherwise upland looking trees like red maple, but all the, all the way down to plants like in the upper right. Um, and that's a rickia species. That's a liverwort that only occurs in inundated sites. Um, we've got a lot of aquatic plants, for example most of which we don't see at the edge of wetlands, but nonetheless uh, will help us identify those wetlands and the plant criterion. Uh, the legal definition, which is 
really the basis by which we derive our sort of policies and derive our regulations um, and really captures those three technical criteria is listed as follows. Uh, wetlands are those areas that are saturated or inundated uh, by surface or groundwater at a frequency and duration sufficient to support and that under normal circumstances do support a prevalence of vegetation adapted to life in saturated soil conditions. And if we break that down a little bit, you can see that water's got to be present, but it's got to be present for a long enough period of time that that anaerobia develops in the soil horizon. And as a consequence, supports plants that predominantly live in saturated or inundated soils. And so therein lies all three of those um, technical criteria, which for those of us that do wetlands work, um, are further defined by morphological features that we have to identify in the field. So the context for wetland protection uh, is pretty straightforward. Once upon a time, uh, we had over 220 million acres in the US that were identifiable as wetlands. And <clears throat> we have less than half that at present. Most of that conversion has been a result of uh, agriculture, but in the coastal zones, certainly uh, development. And for many of our shallow water bodies, uh, dams and other uh, types of infrastructure that's changed the water table, whether through flooding or draining, uh, that has resulted in a tremendous loss, um, especially in the coastal zone of the Southeast and the Midwest, which is, has you know, largely the sort of breadbasket of, of this country, as they call it. Over 95% of our waters in the Northeast are freshwater, uh, but we do have a string of saline or actually hailing wetlands uh, along the coastal zone as well, not so much in New Hampshire, Great Bay is pretty much our only big uh, estuarine or marine system that we have along our 13 miles of coastline. But on the inland side of things, the forested wetlands are really the dominant. And these are the ones that most of us in the Conservation Commission uh, universe are, are dealing with on a regular basis. Uh, agricultural wetlands to some extent, especially wetlands that have been converted for agriculture, are another common uh, situation that we come across, but the forested wetland type is really the most common one and certainly the one that we uh, deal with uh, uh, for most of our violations in the state. That being said, uh, there are more than 2,500 permits a year that are fulfilling dredge in wetlands and that over the last 20 years has exceeded 88 acres of wetland loss per year. So in terms of wetland science and what we deal with, we tend to break it down into a few categories that sort of helps break it out. And it's useful, I found, uh, in teaching about wetland science and policy to have these categories presented in somewhat of a sequential order so that you begin to understand how each aspect of wetland science relates to another. First and foremost, there's the identification and mapping of wetlands. Where are they on the landscape? How extent, extensive are they? And can we readily discern them from offsite? That is to say from a remote data source like a GIS map. Second to that, once we recognize where they are, or at least we've identified that they're present on the landscape, what types of wetlands do we have? What types of course relate to uh, the water that's present, the type of water, when it occurs. It also relates to the functions and values that we'll talk about, and it relates to some of the issues that we deal with relative to conservation and protection. Once we have identified where the wetlands are and we've classified them, and we'll go over each of these topics a little more in detail after this slide, um, 
it's very useful to identify what the functions and values are. What are, for example, the ecosystem services of the wetlands on the landscape? And what are they doing for us as a society of spe a species that um, doesn't necessarily understand what's going on and certainly doesn't necessarily um, uh, appreciate the, the value of those services? Flood storage is clearly one of the most, um, I should say, important uh, functions that has helped us over the years. And for anybody that's been through a flooding event, you understand what I'm talking about. Uh, mitigation and restoration, of course, it, in the event that we do impact wetlands for various reasons, whether it's development, or expanding a roadway that's needed, uh, widening a bridge, uh, then typically, if it exceeds a certain amount of square feet of impact, um, which has, as many of you may be aware recently, changed to greater than 5,000 square feet in the current Army Corps of Engineers um, statewide programmatic permit, um, then we need to mitigate for that loss of wetlands that we're impacting. And the mitigation restoration side of it is another huge part of wetland science that many of us uh, professionals deal with on a regular basis. And then last but not least is um, the sort of conservation and regulatory side of things where we can, once we have a better understanding of wetlands in our town, what they're doing, how can we protect them? And really for the public benefit of protecting um, the sort of fabric of the ecosystem that we live uh, within. And that comes in many shapes and forms. I've just for example, highlighted a master plan, uh, which typically contains a chapter on natural resources and a lot of those that we're trying to protect involve wetland systems. So in terms of identification and mapping, um, we have now just a, a tremendous resource that are literally at our fingertips. Um, having been in the sort of pre-computer age and being old enough to <laughs> to know what it was like back when we were, you know, we'd send, put a postage stamp on a letter and make a written request to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or the National, you know, Aeronautics Association or program and try and get a black and white map of our area. And it would take six weeks to deliver that. And then, then we'd have to sort of discern on this, uh, maybe using a stereoscope, where the wetlands were on these black and white maps. It has all changed, which is, fantastic. We have high resolution aerial photography and satellite imagery that has, you know, revolutionized what we can do in terms of identification and mapping. Uh, on the left, I have this aerial base map for just a sample property in Tuftonboro, Wolfboro. And the yellow lines on this map show an approximate location of those wetlands, of wetlands on the ground. And that's just on the basis of looking at vegetation differences on the aerial photograph. Uh, again, which is the way that most of us did it, and certainly the way that uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service did it for the National Wetlands Inventory Program back in the 80s, right? That was, that was how these NWI maps were made through aerial photo interpretation. But since that time, we've had this wonderful thing called LIDAR, light and density uh, imaging software that has taken laser shots of the surface of the earth and eliminated all the cover the trees and the buildings and everything else and give you sort of this bare earth image, which provides a hugely uh, instructive and informative uh, remote data layer that we can use to, for example, and as you see in this image, uh, discern where the top of bank is, which is we'll talk in our second session with Sandy about jurisdiction and what New Hampshire holds as a jurisdictional wetland area includes anything below the top of bank on these stream systems. And having a LIDAR image like this, where you can actually map the top of bank based on shaded relief, if not that, the two foot contours, that's a derivative from that LIDAR image. Um, it's a fantastic resource that's allowed all of us to really sharpen our pencils, so to speak, um, and, and you know, identify the exact location of these wetlands. Back in the 80s, when I was mapping uh, wetlands using the uh, federal national wetlands inventory maps, 
um, I'd come up with something on the order of say 30 acres of wetlands in a given 100 acre tract. Um, and there'd be these rough edges that we'd use uh, for mapping these wetlands. And then we'd overlay the soil types, which are even more rough and provide maybe an intersection. And for about 20 years, for the towns that I mapped, uh, town-wide mapping of wetlands, um, the, the actual number of field-based wetlands turned out to be about half the total, the combined total of the hydric soils and the NWI. So if you added all the NWI wetlands and acres and added up the total hydric soil acreage and you divided it in two, you'd get the approximate amount of wetlands on the landscape. And that's still fairly common, uh, in, at least in the North Country, uh, where we don't have yet the NWI plus, which we'll talk about a different mapping regime that enhanced the initial NWI mapping in the, the southern part of the state. So it's still, you know, it's still a useful formula if you're trying to do, you know, a townwide wetland map and all you've got are uh, NWI and hydric soils. Um, but as you Rick, can see with the LIDAR. Uh, Rick, can I yes, just ask um, a question that, that before you go on to the next slide? Sure. Um, Myrtle wanted to ask if you could point out top of bank. I don't know how easily okay. you do that with your little cursor there or not. Can, 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 you, can you see the cursor? I can. Oh, okay. Got a little white okay. arrow there. So, so that white arrow, there's a top of bank. You can see the black and white line, right? And as I follow that top of bank around, okay, there's your jurisdictional edge on this stream system. All right, and of course I've got this blown out. This is like one to 12,000 or something, but once you zoom in and you can get into about one to 1,000 uh, in terms of a scale and still see good resolution on the LIDAR image. Um, and that's just using the bare earth image of LIDAR. I haven't even talked about, you know, what you can do with the raw data. Um, here's another example of the LIDAR and what is really, terrific about this, as many of you know have used this, um, you can see the stone walls very easily, right? Here's a series of stone walls, the old farm landscape, and you can see where farming has taken place in the past, whereas down in here, not so much. You don't see those, the sort of glacial deposit lines. Remember, the glaciers are coming northwest to southeast and sort of scraping the ice across the landscape. Well, you don't necessarily see that in some of these other wetland areas. You see a very different surficial topography. And that, again, can cue you into where these wetlands are and what the soils are actually looking like when you get onto the ground. So it's kind of a neat, neat source of information that, again, is, has really changed a lot of our work in terms of doing wetland identification and mapping on the landscape. So an example from one of the towns that I mapped, just to show how statistics can sort of, you know, help you out. Um, this is a, an example from Pembroke, uh, which I did about 10 years ago now. Uh, 14,000 acre town with 1,376 acres of wetlands that were derived from aerial photographs. Now this was 10 years ago, so it was pre-LIDAR. And my guess is that if I did have the LIDAR mapping available at that time, that 1,376 acre total would be more, right? And we'll, you know, we, you, you may have remember from the slide before where an estimate based on the NWI plus is that about 14 and a half percent of our landscape is wet. Well, in Pembroke, that 1,376 acres is a little less than, than 10 percent. It's like nine and a half percent. And my guess is that it would be bumped up above 10% if I had LIDAR mapping available at that time. Again, this is a townwide mapping effort. It's not something where any of us as wetland scientists can go throughout the town and all the private properties and map wetlands in the field. This is an estimate, but it gives us a pretty good idea. For example, the difference between poorly drained soils, that's what the PD stands for, and the very poorly drained soils, where the most critical and how much of those real critical uh, priority resource areas are on the landscape. And, and that's a term I'm using very 
uh, judiciously, because we're going to talk a lot about that in the future sessions. But this is a the highest quality wetland areas typically have very poorly drained soils. So right away, you can see almost half, not quite, of the town of Pembroke wetland resource has very poorly drained soils. And again, as you look at the left here, the mapping that, that I did for that, you can you know, lift out from the classification map uh, where those uh, very poorly drained soils are. And of course, I produced maps for the town that show exactly where they are, or at least according to the MWI uh, aerial photo stuff. And then we have 307 acres of water and there's some riparian areas. There's some islands that are surrounded by water or wetlands. And so, you know, all total, we come up with uh, uh, another uh, value that is, I think, instructive for mapping wetlands on a townwide basis. And that is the number of wetland map units. Uh, each of these uh, areas here are individual wetland map units. And then, what the average size is. And that gives you a sense of the interspersion of those wetland map units. It will also lend itself to under, better understanding what um, the wetland functions are on the landscape. So this is the classification system. Uh, as we move from identification and mapping into classification, this is our standard. And it's a federal standard that's been around since 1979. Uh, it was authored by uh, primarily four authors, one of whom was at University of Rhode Island. So we did have a New Englander, as it were, on the team, uh, Frank Gullett. And uh, it's been adopted by most states as the classification standard. We have some new standards uh, sort of floating around the US nowadays, but nonetheless, most states, and especially our state, uh, uses this as the basis for understanding uh, what types of wetlands we have on the landscape. Um, as was noted in the abstract on the first page, uh, uh, it's intended to describe ecological taxa and taxa is just a, a you know, an, an, it's like a species as it were of, of, of ecology. And it's a system that's useful for resource managers um, because it provides a standardized approach to labeling these wetland types uh, across the country. And that standard was deemed to be you know, extremely important. It was actually a decision made during the Carter administration and then implemented um, soon thereafter and uh, signed sort of into a, by executive order in 1970, uh, actually it was 1980 by the time that um, the classification was done. Um, it lumps the sort of wetland types into five buckets, so to speak. We've got the marine system, which has a couple of subsystems. So the marine is the system level, as is Astrin, which is, you know, that coastal zone, mixed fresh and salt water. Uh, the riverine si system and Lacustrin, which is the lake or uh, you know, impounded water body systems uh, and uh, system, and then the palustrian or freshwater uh, wetland system. And for the first four, there are subsystems, subtitle, intertitle for both marine and estuarine. Um, and then among the, the riverine system, we've got it broken out into a few subsystems. Uh, pay attention that that intermittent is recognized here because that is also an area that falls under the jurisdiction of the New Hampshire uh, DES Wetlands Bureau. Uh, so any impacts to intermittent streams, believe it or not, are also subject to permitting as are uh, the perennial streams and, and uh, regular palustrian wetlands. The lacustrian is broken out into two. That's the literal and limnetic. The literal is the shoreline zone of these ponds and lakes that we have, uh, a, a thousand of <laughs> named pond, uh, lakes in the state. And uh, the limnetic is the, the, the sort of lens shaped deep water bodies. Again, uh, shallower than 6.6 than, uh, .6 feet, uh, uh, according to the classification by Coward that, that, that defines the deep water limit. Um, each of these class uh, systems, rather, and subsystems are further broke into, broken down into wetland classes. 
um, that are based on life form, uh, substrate, and water regime. Um, and we'll go over a couple of these uh, in terms of the palustrin, which is, like I said, our most common wetland type on the landscape, these freshwater wetlands that we're dealing with. There are five classes that are organized according to life form, right? The aquatic bed, the deeper end of the spectrum of the water table where you've got floating uh, leaved aquatics like water lilies and floating heart and so on. Those are typically inundated year round, right? Then we've got a moss lichen type recognized for our peatlands, which are primarily sphagnum moss dominated, uh, our bogs and fens, for example. Um, the emergent class, which is uh, largely those, think cattails. These are plants that are adapted to living in water, enough water that prevents trees and shrubs from growing, but these herbaceous plants like cattails and bulrushes and so forth are the dominant on the landscape. And these first three, the aquatic bed, moss-like and emergent are all part of that priority resource area that, we, that I mentioned before. These are the higher quality, uh, higher functioning, very poorly drained wetland systems. Scrub shrub to a certain extent falls within certain high water or very poorly drained uh, uh, soil types as well, but not always. And there are several examples where we've got scrub shrub wetlands that are on poorly drained sites, for example. Um, that's a fairly significant resource in our state, representing anywhere from 18 to 20 percent of the wetland resource. And then forested, as I mentioned, greater than 60 percent of our wetland resources in the state dominated by trees. And that too can also be in poorly drained or very poorly drained situations. You can go from, say, a shallow uh, uh, water table red maple swamp that's pit and mound. Uh, not unlike that video that I showed you of that sort of tricky wetland delineation area on a slope. And you can go all the way down to say an Atlantic white cedar swamp, which is inundated perennially, very rarely dries out and is dominated by a trees that are only adapted to growing in, in very wet situations. In those uh, classes, we further uh, define what is called the water regime. And you can read on this slide, uh, both in tidal and non-tidal situations, um, that the water can come at various times of year and can be there or present for a certain length of time. Um, our most common situation in the water regime sort of uh, modifier is the seasonally flooded slash saturated. Okay, so seasonally flooded slash saturated. And that's uh, typically present at all of our forested swamps, right? They're wet in the winter time, the non-growing season, by the time the temperatures warm up, the frost is gone, and the plants start to really drink up that water at the surface. Uh, that water level can go right down below the surface. And sometimes you're walking on dry ground uh, that may be poorly drained, but uh, has dried out during the summer season. So uh, at best, it may be only saturated uh, at that point uh, in the year. So hence the most common, again, for our wetland systems in New Hampshire, uh, seasonally flooded slash saturated. We mostly have a freshwater situation in our state, but we do have uh, occasion to have um, uh, hailing uh, conditions, that's uh, coastally, uh, the saltwater intrusion, saltwater bays and so forth. Uh, the saline, uh, according to the Venice system and the Cowardin uh, classification is primarily adapted for Western sites. Think uh, dry lakes and dry basins and salt pans and that type of thing, which are much, much more common out West. And then occasionally we have these modifiers, special modifiers we have to add um, so you might see a, an I or a D or an X or something like that. And on the end of these coward and classification symbols that indicate excavated soils, impounded dike, and so, and so forth. 
So I mean, I'll give you a little example of how this works. Um, here's a, a classification of a palustrin, that's the P part. Unconsolidated bottom, that's the UB part. One, which refers to, in this case, the type of substrate that we're talking about, and H, uh, which means permanently flooded, right? And here we have a pond. This is just an example from Center Harbor where we've got Hawkins Pond and Bear Pond. Those are both classified as a PUB1H, okay? And that's, um, that's a typical, um, uh, you know, classification for these, our ponds and lakes, or I should say our ponds, because remember, if it's a big enough a water body to be a lake, there would be an L up front standing for lacustrine. Here's a palustrine forested, that's the FO, 4 slash 1E. And in this case, we're talking about needle-leaved evergreen, which is what 4 stands for, and 1, deciduous-leaved, broadleaf deciduous, rather, and that's like red maple, et cetera. And, and then the E is that seasonally flooded slash saturated. So this tells you that this is a forested swamp with more conifers than hardwoods. And it floods in the wintertime and typically dries out at least at the surface in the summertime, right? And similarly here, we've got a combinational uh, characterization, uh, PFO slash SS1E, a forested scrub shrub swamp in these two green areas with a deciduous base and a seasonally flooded slash saturated water regime modifier. PSS1E for an area that's just scrub shrub in brown here, this is sort of an inflow to Hawkins Pond and it's all alder dominated. So that's not uncommon when you're dealing with alder alluvial swamps that um, don't have any trees or very few trees in them. Uh, as you get down in this little stream system going from Bear Pond to Hawkins Pond, it get, the water gets deeper. And that's where you enter those palustrine aquatic bed, that aquatic bed type I mentioned before, that like water lilies, et cetera, that it's um, anywhere from, you know, pretty much water at the surface uh, year round, which is an H again, permanently uh, flooded, um, down to that 6.6 .6 foot uh, depth uh, at mean high water that indicates where the deep water. Uh, system begins in blue there. And then last but not least, we've got a couple of uh, palustrin scrub shrub three Fs, and the three is uh, a broadleafed evergreen. And if you think of broadleaf evergreen, we're not talking rhododendron here, we're talking leather leaf, which is our most common broadleafed evergreen. And it's very common in bog mats, fen mats, that are at the edges of ponds or isolated in kettle hole bogs, etc. That's you'll see that three come in and F refers to the semi-permanently flooded. It's not quite as wet as the H's are, but it's nonetheless uh, fairly, fairly wet, hence the leather leaf. So that just gives you an example of, of some classification types. Let's see how we're doing on time. All right, 1240, good. So functions and values, this is the last largest section I'll talk about on this in this introductory uh, introduction to wetlands seminar. Um, and it really gets at the, what I consider, well, I would say the meat of the subject, but I'm a vegetarian, so I, <laughs> I'd have to say the tofu of the subject or something like that. Uh, but this is really, really what we, you know, we, we've learned a lot about uh, what wetlands are, where they are in the landscape, what types of wetlands. Now let's understand what these wetlands are doing for us. Right. And the 12 functions that you see here are ones that um, we derived from the New Hampshire method. This was Alan Ammon and Amanda uh, Lily Stone uh, back in the late 80s. I, I was on the sort of review committee, but I was not a principal author at, at that time. Uh, and then, of course, we rewrote the manual in 2011. Uh, changed a lot of this, uh, the text around, changed the functions around. We updated it with new information. And these are the 12 functions that we identified in the New Hampshire method. But they're very similar to and overlap largely with the federally recognized functions that are used in the federal highways assessment methodology. Again, if you look at New Hampshire rules, they're 
You can use different methods for assessing wetlands, but you have to call out certain numbers of those basic, basic functions in order to identify, um, for example, uh, what mitigation might re be required if you're impacting those wetlands, or if you have, for example, a priority resource area, which has to have a certain number of, of these basic functions. So I like to, to, again, for simplicity's sake, look at what these functions uh, mean and what these wetlands are doing for us. And uh, through an exercise that uh, the New Hampshire Association of Natural Resource Scientists and uh, uh, New Hampshire DES Wetlands Bureau did uh, uh, roughly seven years ago, um, we recognize that you know, we can sort of throw these functions into to four buckets. Um, and relative to the sort of user value and what people in towns and conservation commissions are most interested in, um, I like the top three as the ones that, that sort of sell themselves. First and foremost, the water quality functions, right? These are ones that uh, really provide us with good, clean drinking water. Okay, now we can have all kinds of, you know, uh, stratified drift aquifer sources for our drinking water on the landscape, but all of these are being affected by water that's filtering down from above. And if we compromise that water that's filtering down from above, we will compromise our ability to take that water up and drink it without treatment, right? So, so these are pretty critical. Everybody needs to drink water. Ecological integrity refers to that area, you know, the, the basic landscape context. And again, I'll go through each of these functions a little bit more in detail, but you get uh, to get an initial sense. This is really the sort of landscape level look. How well is sediment being trapped as it's moving across the landscape in the form of runoff from flood events? Is that sediment going into our waterways or not? That has a great deal to do with water quality. Nutrients. We had, as some of you know, uh, the introduction of a, yet another cyanobacteria bill this year to deal with cyanobacteria blooms in our state. 48 different outbreaks last year, the highest on record, and it's not getting any better. We've got nutrients feeding our waterways that are creating these toxic cyanobacteria blooms. So nutrient transformation is critical. Is the phosphorus being released into the waterways or not? And this is something that wetlands are absolutely the front line of defense for uptaking these nutrients, right? So it's a critical, critical function for water quality. And then last but not least, the shoreline anchoring. That's also very, very important. We think about, oh yeah, okay, it's shoreline of lakes, but no, we're talking about shoreline as it relates to rivers and streams as well. And if we've got rivers and streams with shorelines that are being eroded by floodwaters that are exceeding our wildest dream projections back in the 80s and 90s, then we had better try and hold on to that shoreline and maintain some integrity, not impact it, and again, retain the water quality functions that that serves. Um, so that's water quality. That's sort of the, you know, the first and easiest to imagine as being a critical function set in, in wetlands. The second is flood water and water quantity. It has to do with how much water is on the landscape at what length of time. We've got uh, flood storage potential is a critical uh, function that Nancy Rendell sort of helped rewrite that for the New Hampshire method and came up with, I think, a very useful model for estimating what the flood storage potential is for wetlands. Um, coupled with that is groundwater recharge. As I mentioned before, we've got stratified drift aquifers providing people with drinking water. How much water is going into that ground and how much is going into either uh, a, a soil based or substrate based, uh, you know, unconsolidated uh, a bed that's providing drinking water, how much is going into bedrock, bedrock aquifers, right? The consolidated form. So that's another huge issue in how much wetlands uh, release as the floodwaters saturate them uh, is, is also uh, directly related to property damage downstream, which is a concern for everybody. 
right? So that's why, as most of you know, we're in this tremendous uptick in replacing failing culverts and bridges in the state to address these, you know, 100 year events that we're getting every every few years now, uh, like Hurricane Sandy and Hurricane Irene and and the July 2018 event, a new found. And there's, you know, just we have lots of examples. And then last but not least, in that sort of top tier of, of what I would call the more technical criteria is the wildlife. And so much of what we are trying to do in, with our wetlands is protect source sites for our wildlife diversity. And wetlands provide a large, the largesse of our source sites. And if you look at things like, you know, Lynn Boyd's Buffers and Beyond book, um, she recognizes that three quarters or more of our wildlife species that we come to love and enjoy and maybe hunt or use otherwise um, are dependent upon wetlands, right? And when we looked at this group, the Nanners group looked at uh, wetland buffers and the use of wetland buffers by wildlife, um, those buffers are pretty wide. The mean uh, uh, sort of distance, horizontal distance off the edge of wet that was used actively by wildlife as found in the literature, and we did a lot of literature review on this, was 100 meters or 300 feet, right? And uh, without, you know, getting into the next sort of seminar series on, on jurisdiction and what we're trying to do in terms of protect wetlands, I'll suggest that just the wetland itself is great, but it's not quite enough. And if you think about our fish and aquatic life habitat, and you think about what's where the runoff is coming from and how much that affects the water quality that's affecting the fish and the aquatic life, you recognize that as a system, and we're talking functions and values associated with that system, that system requires integrity be well beyond the edge of wet. But we'll get, get back to that at another time. And then last but not least, this sort of what I call the social functions of scenic quality, education potential, and wetland-based recreation. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about some more of these. So this is an ecological integrity, like I said, is the landscape level. What's going on on the landscape level that's really affecting uh, um, you know, how water moves through the landscape and, and what the quality of that water is? Do we have, for example, a gravel pit in the midst of our, our highest yield stratified drift aquifer in our town? It's not uncommon because guess what? <laughs> stratified drift means sand and gravel. <laughs> so. You know, it's, and so how can we combine those? How can we protect the water that's going into our aquifers that we're drinking downstream and at the same time yield a product that's necessary for construction and development, right? So that, those are, these are some of the issues that we're talking about with ecological integrity. How do we address climate change things that are affecting our moose? That's a, that's a huge regional uh, issue that we're dealing with because whether or not it's, something that has to do with the quality of our water, there's a lot more associated on the landscape level with water quality or qu quality that's, that's associated with wildlife. Um, not the least of which, some of it you may remember when the Eastern Block, the Quabbin Reservoir was opened up to hunting, primarily because the deer were chewing up all the trees and there was a lot less water going into Quabbin Reservoir to, to serve Boston because the deer were eating up all the trees that were supposed to grow up in the watershed. So you institute a hunting program to offset the deer overpopulation so that the forest would be able to regrow and an intact watershed above Quabbin would continue to provide water to Boston. That's just one example of hundreds that I could talk about that has to do with ecological integrity in the, on the landscape level. Wetland wildlife habitat, um, depends obviously on some of those landscape features, but also depends on um, you know, how much of the wetland buffer is being affected by development, roads, impervious surfaces, other compromising uh, conditions that would otherwise affect what kinds of wildlife depend upon that, that wetland itself. Um, this mink picture of the mink was right along the uh, Merrimack River and, and you know, it, it, it's it's one thing if if you have a river that's you know largely intact with uh, a floodplain where it can flood and deposit sediment and um, you know, carry off woody debris that ends up in the banks and provides dens and hollows. 
it's another if you've if you've got a parking lot right up to the edge of the river. So the, these are some of the concerns that this wetland wildlife habitat function uh, gets at. And when you peel down through the assessment uh, questions that you have in that function, uh, that's what you're gonna be uh, uh, answering. Uh, fish and aquatic life was broken out for a very uh, purposefully uh, from the sort of general wet wetland dependent wildlife function because of uh, waterways, because of, of moving waterways, streams, rivers, et cetera. This, these are the sites that have um, the capacity of transporting um, the lack of ecological integrity downstream. Um, and we've got a lot of situations where uh, some of our populations of trout, for example, or salmon are being affected downstream from issues that are happening way, way upstream in the headwaters. Right, and this is where uh, you know some of our organizations, like the New Hampshire Lakes Association, really needs to be uh, tightly inter interconnected with the watershed associations, so that the entire uh, span of where water moves to these uh, watersheds are is being con considered. And so that that you know, are there dams in the stream? Are there barriers to passage of fish? These are some of the questions you'll be looking at when you're dealing with the fish and aquatic life habitat function. Uh, scenic quality, I'm just going in order of the 12 that, that we had at the at first list, uh, is uh, one of the uh, social functions, but a very important one, right? It's not like, oh, we should, it's just scenic quality. No, because when you think about it, and I've got a place in my town where um, we've actually designated as a view shed area, and guess what? It's at the edge of this big swamp. <laughs> you know, I think about driving by Sawmill Swamp, for example. Paul, I got to say it. You know, you get a beautiful view of the swamp, and that everybody loves that. You know, it's great not to be looking at houses. You have this gorgeous thing that turns bright red and yellow in the in the fall, and it, it you know it's it's got wildlife and birds and you know all kinds of values that relate to its aesthetic qualities. So that that is an important function that we should not really overlook. Um, as a professor, I've, of course, <laughs> used many, many wetlands for teaching um, and have had some exceptional teachers like Sid Pilgrim there on the left uh, who have you know, brought to life the value of these wetland systems and their functions uh, and only been able to do so because we have these present on the landscape and available for doing research and learning more about what's important uh, um, associated with these wetlands. So, you know, education potential is important. It's something that we want to engender in our next generation, certainly. Um, I, I loved it when, they, you know, I didn't like it so much when they built the new Merrimack High School, but I loved it, the fact that they had vernal pools out their back door. They didn't have to get in a bus to find a vernal pool. So that was uh, an upside of, of that, that, I don't know, that was probably 20 years ago or more. Um, and then wetland-based recreation, another what I call social function, but also a critical part of what we enjoy in our state and what a lot of thousands and thousands of visitors enjoy in our state are dependent upon wetlands. And you know, hard, you know, it's hard not to come across a situation in, in a lake where kids are playing in the in the shallows, in, in aquatic beds, and where people are canoeing or kayaking. Um, you know, this is this is what happens every day with you know by the thousands in our state, and it's part of what drives our economy. So it's really a, a critical part of that. Um, I hardly need to say much about uh, flood storage potential, other than I'm glad I don't live in Louisiana um, <laughs> or maybe North Carolina or Florida. We're a little lucky up here. Uh, we just have avoided a big hurricane, but um, it will come back. We'll have another one. Um, we had the hurricane of 38. We're due for another one. Um, our hurricane average used to be 100 to 125 years in New England. Uh, it's sort of increasing now to less than that, which means the big one is um, going to be at our doorstep. Um, um, hopefully not in all of our lifetimes, but certainly probably not in my lifetime, but maybe, maybe it will be. Um, and so we have to be prepared. And the flood storage potential of wetlands is really, it's the sponge on the landscape that prevents downstream flow. It's very simple. 
you know, it's an easy concept to grasp. And if you've been through a flooding event or you've had your culvert taken out by a stream over overtopping its banks, uh, you know what I'm talking about and you know how valuable and how destructive these things can happen. So here again, uh, at the very least, is another big reason to, to protect and conserve our wetlands. Groundwater use, we already talked about, um, the wetlands above our stratified drift aquifers, but also those above the bedrock aquifers that we use. We have some bedrock aquifers that actually exceed the output capacity of our stratified dr drift aquifers. So it's not like, oh yeah, everybody that's down on the flat, sandy, gravelly plains need to take care of their wetlands. No, we need to do the same thing above, above them on the side slopes as well. Uh, I mentioned sediment trapping, um, and these pictures in this slide uh, actually refer to a, um, a created detention pond at a Walmart site I worked at 30 years ago. And um, within three days of, of us creating that pond and having it established and planning it out, we had floodwater events that proved the, the, the worth of them. And so our detention basins uh, are, are critical. And if you think of the naturally occurring wetlands, this is what happens in our naturally occurring wetlands as well after these stormwater events. Uh, the same goes with nutrients. Uh, our nutrients are be, being uptaken by plant roots um, uh, all the time. Uh, they, yes, there's some dormancy in the winter time, but there's still activity going on above, they used to say biological zero. Now we know it's actually below 41 degrees when there's actual bacterial meta metabolic activities that's helping uh, transform nutrients even in those colder climates. And I think those of you that may know about Alaskan soils and what goes on there uh, can relate to the fact that it, you, you don't always have to get to 40 degrees. Um, consider the fact we're, we're, we're getting close to our next sugaring season and sap is going to start flowing well before we have 40 <laughs> 40 degrees on the on the surface of the soil. So, um, you know, this is going on all the time, and it's a critical function that helps de, uh, um, sort of, you know, take out, transform, uptake nitrogen and phosphorus are two primary culprits relative to downstream water quality water quality concerns. Shoreline anchoring, uh, yeah, I mentioned this before, and uh, the upper left. Uh, I think that's Province Lake, tremendous aquatic bed that's providing floodwater desynchronization. Uh, that is to say, uh, either from floods or high winds or boat traffic. All of that takes place when there's a well vegetated aquatic bed in a in a lentic water body like a pond or a lake. But equally as important is you know, are the stream systems, um, where as you can see from this example. Uh, from Vermont uh, during Hurricane Irene, um, those systems can be severely taxed and all of that brown color is sediment from eroded stream banks upstream. And that's ending up, a lot of that ended up in the Connecticut River um, above Wilder Dam. <laughs> so um, again, a critical function. And then last but not least on this sort of suite of, of functions is uh, what we call noteworthiness. Uh, unique features is I think what, how it's called in, uh, or uniqueness in the Federal Highways Assessment Methodology. And it deals with you know, things like rare and endangered species and special, special resources that are either locally or regionally uh, important. Um, in our uh, method, we cited the Wildlife Action Plan. Do we have wildlife habitat that's the highest ranked in the state? Well, that's a noteworthy feature, right? So we've got a, a list of these that you go through um, for identifying noteworthiness and it adds again, a value, sort of a, a template value to the overall assessment. Okay, let's, let's just do a time check. I'm pretty close to the end here. But I just want to say just a few words about um, natural communities. Uh, many of you know about now the Cowardin system of national wetlands inventory classification, but there are other classifications out there that 
actually have a lot to do with the functions of wetlands. And in fact, um, if we have a particular type of community, uh, we can absolutely predict some of these functions as taking place. So it's useful to have this as um, a, a, at least a concept in the back of your mind. It will also um, be uh, instructive if you're applying for aquatic resource mitigation fund grant. Um, you'll need to know what the natural communities are or your, or your wetland scientist hired gun person would will need to know because that's that's a requirement as well. In short, these are simply assemblages of plants and animals that occur on the physical landscape in a repeating pattern over time, right? And Dan Sperduto and Bill Nichols sort of first identified these terms back in the 90s uh, and they've been carried forth in, in, in from the sort of nature serve classification, national classification uh, system uh, in, in the United States. And, you know, these are again, repeatable and observable uh, assemblages that um, in the wetland environment are very distinct. Um, of the 192 different natural communities recognized in the state of New Hampshire, three quarters of them are wetland associated. And if you look at a natural communities map, and I've done many of uh, different parts of the, the state, um, you look at these broad swaths of hemlock, beech oak, pine forest, et cetera, and then all this, you know, spaghetti-like matrix of these very finely defined um, natural communities, and those are the wetland systems. So again, we have our greatest diversity of species in wetlands. We have our greatest diversity, of course, of natural communities in wetlands. Um, it allows you to compare landscapes. Uh, you can determine whether an area is unique or, uh, or you know, in its relative size to other areas. Uh, it gives you a, a sampling of uh, diversity of species. Uh, and there's so many of our, our rare and endangered, you know, species, both plant, animal, and animal, uh, and otherwise, um, that are dependent upon these specific sites. So it, it helps if you're thinking about conserving uh, wildlife, like in landings turtles, then it's important to know what natural communities that they actually use and travel to in order to optimize their, their, their life survival skills. So this is something that I've, I've wanted to add into this uh, introductory slideshow to make sure that you had a, a concept of, and there's a lot of great information at the Natural Heritage Bureau website. Um, to, and that's a part of DANCER, uh, Department of Cultural and Natural Resources. Um, and they have a whole, you can get, download the entire natural community guide, and you can download a list of all the rare stuff um, that occurs in your town. Um, on their website. And just to one last sort of comparison to show you the difference. Here's an example of a, of a national wetlands inventory overlay uh, <clears throat> from a site in Holderness. Uh, this is what the map showed that you can download from US Fish and Wildlife Service site. You can get this, of course, the NWI maps now on several of our state uh, GIS sites. And Here's the view of the natural community types as mapped from both field and aerial uh, inspection. So, you know, again, um, you know, pretty simple view of different types according to the Cowardin system, but much more complex on the natural community side of the mapping uh, system and, and much more instructive in terms of what, what you can do uh, for research, protection, buffering, all of that. All right, so this is just a, a quick recap, online wetland resources. I wanted to flash this up since this will be, uh, this is recorded and will be available. Um, and it's it, it offers just a few of the resources. If you say go to the uh, New Hampshire method, we have an appendix that has a lot of these online resources listed. Although uh, our last publication dated 2015 makes some of them um, um, not necessarily obsolete, but not all of them are there. For example, the one-stop data site for DES is not in the 2015 New Hampshire method, nor is the one-stop data map, since they were uh, developed after we got done. Aquatic restoration mapper, permit planning tool, and the National Wetlands Inventory Mapper from the Fish and Wildlife Service. 
we're going to be talking about these in the upcoming seminars. And uh, Stephanie Tetro from DES, our, our actual, you know, will have a, a, an entire seminar devoted to getting you all up to speed on how to access these different mapping online mapping tools that will help you in your town or with your particular projects of concern. All right, so we're gonna go over this and, um, and we'll have a chance to, to talk about this in, in, in upcoming seminars. All righty, that's, uh, that's pretty much what I had. Barbara, I'm gonna stop my All right. screen share. I think I've got Thank about you, an hour. Rick. Yeah, you did great on the timing, and we did uh, request that these extend a little longer than our traditional lunch and learns. And we have a, quite a few questions in the chat box, so we might Perfect. have to go back a little bit. But right. um, one of the earlier questions was, are rivers, streams, ponds, lakes, estuaries, and oceans wetlands? And I know you covered this a little bit, but a lot of people think surface water, wetlands. Mm -hmm. How would you describe that relationship? That's a great, great question. And I anticipated it, <laughs> uh, but I purposefully didn't want to sort of get into the, the fine tuning sort of definitional because we're going to hit that next session. So it's, an, it's a cue up for next time. You know, what's a jurisdictional area? What do we consider? But to, to, to be clear, um, you know, for those of us that are certified wetland scientists, we know that we have to have all three criteria present for it to be a wetland, unless <laughs> it's a non-normal circumstance or one of these <clears throat> called problem area sites. So for example, a stream is not technically a wetland, but I defy you to find a stream that doesn't have little pockets of wetlands along the stream, like what I would call a string of pearls, use that analogy. And so if you're thinking, oh, it's just a stream, it's, it's still jurisdictional, but it may not be a wetland if it's got flowing waters and no aquatic vegetation, right? Then it's just a water body, it's just a stream. But <laughs> very typically, and I've hit this on countless uh, projects, that were reviewed for whether or not there were wetlands associated with the proposed impacts, it is still jurisdictional. It will still require a permit. It will still require mitigation if you exceed a certain amount of impact. And in terms of, you know, the sort of functions and values, there's no real clear separation between the two. Yeah, right? that's really important to point out. You're, they're still going to be treated the same for... Yeah you know, yeah. on permits. And then this one over is kind of an overlap of that question, but how do floodplains and wetlands usually <clears throat> align with each other? Yeah, really great question. Floodplains are come in many, many sizes, shapes, and forms. When you talk about uh, flood insurance rate maps, the firm maps, and FEMA and its ability to declare areas, disaster areas based on flooding, the 100 year floodplain is typically the line that you want to be concerned about. The zone that typically contains the, uh, the sort of zone A and zone AE and zone X flooding events, which are based on a certain predictive uh, uh, you know, ratio. For example, a 2% flooding event, you know, one in, uh, one in 50 years, you're going to have a floodwaters affecting that area, that type of thing. So you've got floodplain wetlands, which are often where the stream or river has overtopped its bank and scoured out the land to create water tables high enough up that wetlands are supported. And Oxbow Pond is a classic example. We've got hundreds of those in the state. That being said, there are some wetlands that um, are not necessarily connected to the riverine system in the floodplain, but are nonetheless critical to the entire system. These would be groundwater discharge wetlands, which have nothing to do with water from the river. They have everything to do with water coming down the side slope and discharging above the surface or near the surface of the ground at the edge of the floodplain. So you've got this, it's a very highly complex uh, system that you're dealing with with floodplains and 
and believe me, my my you know suggestion on on a lot of this is to to really uh, you know do the field work, do the due diligence, and figure out where the outer limit of all these things are because they are intertwined in such a way that it's not easy to to separate them out. And that's what's so challenging when there is an impact, even if it's you know in a kind of more remote area of, of a wetland complex, it's still gonna have that impact. Um, okay, so here's one, let's see, why, this is back to the mapping and there's a little bit of um, question about why is Hawkins Pond not um, La, La Costrine? How, oh yeah, <laughs> La Costrine. So, La Costrine, so yeah. very, very good question. And that's not an answer that I'm gonna be able to give you yeah. exact definitional criteria on, but in short, a pond is a pond is a pond. It does not have a wave washed shoreline. I see. Okay? If, you have, if you have what they call fetch, enough fetch, that's that area in a, in a lake or open water body where wind can blow and eradicate vegetation on the downwind side. In other words, you have a wave wash, high energy shoreline, typically it's called a lake, typically. But here with a hundred or a thousand lakes and ponds in New Hampshire, it isn't always that way, right? Some of our ponds that we call ponds are in fact lakes. And some of our, well, not very many of our lakes are actually ponds, but certainly a large part of our, our lake systems have sort of ponded or what we call palustrine edges. So it's not, it, it's not an an exact science. Yep. And I can say, if you look across the NWI maps in the state, you'll see situations where the P is used and it really should be an L and vice versa. Yeah, okay. yeah Rick, I, Rick, I, I think Andy. that um, there is actually a size criterion in there for locustrin um, that, that, that some things, if they're, if they get to a certain size, no matter what the vegetation is, they're called lacustrine, and even if they were totally open water, they're um, palustrine because they're too small. Has everything to do with depth too, right? Because you can have that size. Well, the NWI though, you you know, doesn't oh, yeah. have that information because oh, yeah. it's that remote. So, yeah. Um, yeah. so it's. I think if you look at the definition, I think there's some size criteria. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, here's some interesting questions that we might have to figure out together. How can a lot on a river that floods 80% of the land be reevaluated as a wetland? So my, and Claire might have to unmute and ask this question, but it sounds like there's a lot that's flooding 80% of the time, but doesn't appear to have wetland classification. That's that's about right. It's in uh, basically in a, in a flood zone area, which is a flood zone A. Um, but it's um, my concern is uh, that someone might buy it and build on it. And if they do, it's very steep from the from the road. It's very steep, and then it goes in. But it floods every year. And at the point where it floods, I would say the water is at least four to four to six feet deep. And it goes around a, like a curve, <clears throat> so it floods on on this side of the of the of the river, and it also will flood on the other side. So one thing I can say, Claire, is that um, to be a wetland, you have to have the, all three of those technical criteria present. So it can flood even multiple times a year, but if you don't have hydric soils, for example, it's not technically a wetland. It's just a in in the floodplain, right? If you don't have a predominance of wetland plants, you don't have a wetland. You just are in an upland in the floodplain. It doesn't make it any bet much better to to build or develop. In fact, I I'd say that um, you know anything in the hundred year floodplain is is, is suspect uh, for any kind of development, let alone whether you can get uh, you know ins home insurance, <laughs> you know house insurance. But, and if you have concerns about that. Um, a lot of local wetland ordinances allow for a, 30, a third party evaluation of uh, wetland delineation. And if you are concerned that the current delineation is not um, correct, um, having that local wetland ordinance 
may provide the Conservation Commission the opportunity to have another third party evaluate that. But other than that, yeah, it's pretty tricky. Yeah, there's um, a lot of trees on that, on that. And when they took the pictures, they didn't see all the flooding that was going on there. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'd be happy to follow up with you if you want to talk a little bit more about local wetland regulations and how you can, again, get that third party or maybe second opinion type of thing on wetlands. Thank you. Sure. Um, so here's an interesting one, too. How about the loss of hemlocks due to a uh, woolly adelgid and um, ash with the emerald ash borer? How is that going to affect forested wetlands? You got an hour. <laughs> I know. I know. That's it's a it's all a bummer. It's it, a bummer. It, yeah, it, it, it's yeah. it's huge. And, and I don't mean to make it a light yeah. situation, but um, you know, with both species, we're going to see uh, replacement species take over on these sites. For example, hemlock uh, is uh, it's a facultative upland species, but it tolerates areas with high water tables that have enough pit and mound or surface stones to provide a root hole, you know, toe hold for the roots to establish. Red maple is going to take over on on the hemlock sites. That that's hands down. There's there may be some sites that, especially in central northern New Hampshire, where you're going to get more spruce coming in, because spruce, as you know, can tolerate those similar situations. But our warming temperatures are going to really favor red maple over over any boreal species like a spruce. In terms of ash, uh, elm is going to continue to persist, and ash is going to continue to persist. They just won't get very big. And both of those species have their own suites of, you know, systemic uh, pathogens that prevent their development in any kind of big way, like growing into a tree or a forest, but they both persist on the landscape. And even with EAB, you'll see ash just like we did chestnut. I mean, chestnut will, will produce fruit after 15 or 20 years and yet then finally succumb. And the same thing will happen with our ash species. Um, you know, and I, it's hard to say how many years it'll take for them to die back like elm and, and, and chestnut, but um, I think that's what's going to happen. All right, that's pretty interesting. You, you heard it here first, folks. So, all right, how about um, does a well next to or in a forested wetland affect the wetland? So I'm assuming this is maybe a, a groundwater withdrawal and how does that impact our Yeah, wetland? that's really a great question. And the, the way to answer that, which I've done a couple of times, is to actually do a water budget for the site to see what the water, you know, and there are some pretty good online sort of formulas that allow you to calculate based on the watershed size, the area, your site that gives you an annual precipitation rate, snowpack, all those factors go into a water budget. And then you can determine whether or not the withdrawal amount is actually in fact going to affect the water table. We had some in-stream uh, rules, as you know, put into place, you know, a couple of decades ago. Um, and I won't mention names, but there's it was somewhat contested at the time. But nonetheless, it's something that we do need to consider. Uh, I did some work on the castle in the clouds, for example, property with Castle Springs and figuring out what that withdrawal was and how much that would affect downstream wetlands. And it was very illuminating. Um, and uh, in short, um, uh, as much as, uh, you know, their, their allotted million and a half gallon withdrawal a day was less than a percent of the total inputs to the system, less than a percent. Wow. So, so that it, you might be surprised at how much a water well can draw for a community system um, or even a commercial enterprise and not have a huge effect on the surrounding uh, water table. Well, that's good to know. So a water budget, that's pretty cool. I haven't heard of that. So how damaging is the salt and sanding of our roads to wetlands? And what that's can we let, do to lessen the damage? And Sandy put in some great info from DES, but. Good, great. Thank you, Sandy. Um, you know, it it's various. I, I can't give you a broad uh, scale answer. It's good, bad, or moderate. It really depends. You know, it's a classic, it depends. Uh, for example, uh, when I did some uh, chlorides and, and actually conductivity testing on road salting in a vernal pool, because I wanted to know, since I know that chlorides have an impact on the embryonic development of spotted salamanders, and there's some good research on that, I found that the uh, the, the the actual parts per thousand salinity uh, on, on the road salt was dropping by about 95% within 25 feet of the roadway. That was a shock to me. And it's a vernal pool. It's not like 
oh yeah, this has got an upland buffer with trees that are uptaking these chlorides, All right? Now, does that mean that it's okay to have a vernal pool next to a state highway? No, <laughs> but that being said, I was a, a little bit surprised. You look at the long-term term trend data for the Lake Lakes monitoring program and chloride levels. Yeah, we're, we're, we're definitely having an impact. And, and some of those impacts, we don't really fully understand you know, how much that's affecting the bottom of the food chain. That's something that we really need to do more research on. Is it a good thing? Obviously not. How bad of a thing is what I can't quite answer because we need more specifics. And that's where it gets back to the it depends answer. Yeah. Definitely hard to uh, have, have the short answers for a lot of these questions. Yeah. Um, well, that is it in the chat box. Oh, wow. so, okay. uh, I think we really covered a lot of information and we're able to at least get you started on this uh, seven part series that we're working on. I just wanna let you know that the next one will be um, Wetland Laws and Classification of Local, State, and Federal Jurisdiction. And that's going to be Friday, February 24th with Sandy and Rick. So again, um, we're just going to ex you know, add on to what we learned today. I will be sending out a um, link to the recording as well as a handout. And, um, and I'm going to try to include a lot of the resources that we talked about here today as well so that you can check them out, learn a little bit uh, more about what we discussed and um, bring your questions to the next program in February. So um, I also wanted to um, just comment that this program was funded by a grant with the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation. So a lot of people asked, hey, how much money is it gonna cost to do this? And well, luckily we're able to provide this to Conservation Commission members free of charge so that we can get the word out and get um, everybody more confident in their, their work delineating wetlands or at least identifying wetlands and um, and how to approach the wetland permit process. So Barbara, uh, I had one last, uh, you're yes, right, it's 20, 20 acres, Sandy, 20, I, I found it in the, it's 20 acres. So thank you for that. Yeah, 20 acres, that, that it, it has to be at least 20 acres for it to be a lacustrine system. Man. Okay, great. Yeah. All right. See, they, you know, there you go. They've got it here. All right. Um, and again, thank you all for attending. Um, and we'll be uh, following up with all the information. Uh, and I think I think that's all I have. So again, thank you, Rick. Right. Thank you, Sandy. Yeah. And thank you, everybody else who joined us. Um, looking forward to the, the next uh, six programs. All right. Have a great, great afternoon, everybody.